Mike Cardwell has been studying rattlesnakes most of his life, and he holds a graduate degree in biology. Currently, he is studying northern Pacific rattlesnakes at the FER Nature Center using radio telemetry. After getting permits from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Sacramento County Regional Parks, as well as the consent of the Nature Center, Mike began surgically implanting small transmitters in both male and female rattlesnakes. And by using a handheld direction finding antenna, he's able to track the snake's movements. Well, radio telemetry has revolutionized the way biologists study wild animals that are cryptic, in other words, that are, are hard to find. So we've got little uh, miniaturized radio transmitters that are surgically implanted in the snakes, because obviously you can't put a collar uh, or any sort of external attachment on a snake for a variety of reasons. But once that surgery is completed, the little transmitters last for a year, and then we can go out and find the animals using a direction-finding antenna um, anytime we want. And by being able to find them at will, we can study their habits, how much they move, where they spend their time, what they eat, when they mate and reproduce and give birth and that sort of thing. Before being released, the first hollow rattle segment of each snake is injected with a unique combination of colored paint, so it can be easily identified visually. Rattlesnakes play an important role in the ecosystem by helping to control the rodent population, especially mice that can be vectors for hantavirus, and ground squirrels that dig holes in our levees and are hosts for fleas that sometimes carry plague. When they hunt, rattlesnakes strike, bite, inject venom, and then quickly release their prey to avoid being bitten, especially by the large incisor teeth of rodents. And then the rodent runs away and hopefully from the snake's point of view, succumbs to the venom, then the snake has to find it. And it does that by what we call chemosensory searching. It uses, it air sense and it also uses its tongue on the ground to follow the trail of the rodent to find it. And often that takes uh, a number of minutes, maybe an hour or more. Uh, we found in Southern California with the Mojave rattlesnake, it could take many hours. Um, but eventually, most of the time, they find the rodent and then they, they swallow it. Female rattlesnakes reach sexual maturity at about three years and give birth to live offspring in the fall. A typical brood will number between one and 14 babies, with eight being average. Biologists thought that the mothers gave birth to their young and then everyone went their separate directions immediately and that there was no maternal care. Now we know from radio telemetry that many species, including Northern Pacific's, um, do stay together. The mother and young stay together for about a week or 10 days until that first postpartum shed, when the youngsters shed that, that outer layer of their skin the first time. And once they do that, the young leave the, the birthing site, mom leaves, because she probably hasn't eaten in three or four months, and they all disperse after that. But for about a week or 10 days, they stay together. Preliminary data from Mike's study indicate that the males, like other rattlesnakes, have much larger home ranges than females. Because besides hunting for food, the males wander widely during the mating season, looking for females. While the females tend to stay put, where they have adequate food and shelter. Yeah, males spend a lot of time looking for females during the courtship season. And when they find a female, courtship for the males involves um, getting their, their tongue, uh, in these little short tongue flicks and they'll put their chin on top of the female uh, and sometimes their, their neck or, or a big part of their body and they'll do these little short tongue flicks on top of the female and they'll do this little, this little jerking motion that it's very obvious with the head but you can see it back through the whole body of the snake and they'll, they'll jerk and tongue flick and rub their chin on the, on the female's back um, and that's all designed in the snake world to entice the female to be receptive. Uh, and if she is, that's followed by copulation. Rattlesnake myths abound, and it seems everyone has heard at least one. Yeah, probably the most common myth from people I talk to and my colleagues talk to is that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than the adults because they haven't learned to 
control their venom or they, they can't control their venom yet. And that is just patently false. You can get a, a minor bite from a big snake, but you don't get really serious bites from small snakes because they just don't have enough venom to cause a lot of damage. If you encounter a rattlesnake, keep a safe distance and admire this majestic creature. However, if someone strays too close and is bitten, it is important to stay calm and get to a hospital right away. The biggest problem with our bites is soft tissue destruction. Uh, only less than one-tenth of one percent of rattlesnake bite victims actually die. The much greater danger is soft tissue destruction. And physicians that treat rattlesnake bites a lot are fond of saying, time is tissue. Anti-venom can only neutralize venom that hasn't yet caused damage. So the longer the venom's in there without anti-venom, the more damage that occurs, and the anti-venom can't reverse that damage. So the sooner you get to the hospital and start the anti-venom, uh, the more of that venom you can neutralize and the less um, soft tissue damage you'll end up with. And if you come across one on the trail, stay back. I like to tell people stay at least twice the length of the snake away. That, that is way outside their strike range. And then enjoy the encounter. These are very interesting animals. They won't chase you or attack you. Um, they'll often freeze or um, and if you get too close, usually their response is to crawl away. But yeah, enjoy the encounter. Leave it alone. Most people that are bitten, we know from emergency room statistics, are bothering the snake. They're trying to catch it or kill it or make it strike or rattle and they get too close. People that leave them alone and are careful about where they put their hands and feet when they can't see, um, are at very low risk of ever being bitten by a rattlesnake. Mike began the study at Effie Yaw Nature Center in the spring of 2014. He intends to continue for several years to gather enough data to produce compelling conclusions about the seasonal behavior of these rattlesnakes. As he has done with previous efforts, Mike will publish his findings in peer-reviewed journals for colleagues to contemplate and build upon.